It's going down, and you're invited for what they selling. We ain't buying. There is no running. There is no hiding. There's only fighting or dying. It's going down, and you're invited for what they selling. We ain't buying. There is no running. There is no hiding. There's only fighting or dying. It's Going Down is a digital community center from anarchist, anti-fascist, autonomous, anti-capitalist, and anti-colonial movements. Our mission is to provide an autonomous and resilient platform to publicize and promote revolutionary theory and action. Go to itsgoingdown.org for daily updates. Check out our online store for ways to donate and rate and follow us on iTunes if you like this podcast. Uh, hi, this is Peter Gelderless. I'm an anarchist and writer, uh, originally from Virginia, but uh, living uh, most of the past 15 years or so in, in Catalonia. Thank you so much for joining us once again. It's always great to have you on. So today we're going to be talking about a new book you have out, which is overall about climate change, and it's called The Solutions Are Already Here. Tell us about it and why you wrote the book. Oh, well, I'd, I'd actually, uh, uh, <laughs> dispute that intro a little bit. It's, it's in fact, in part about why we shouldn't be looking at the current problem. We shouldn't be understanding this climate change. Uh, so it's, it's a book that, that's about ecological crisis, uh, within an anti-colonial framework. The first part of the book, uh, is, is talking about how, how we need to understand this problem like what is what is the actual dimension of the problem and why why is understanding it as climate change why is understanding it as a question of carbon emissions uh, also part of the problem uh, how that empowers technocratic non-solutions how it cuts out uh, the the greater part of the um, of the harm that's being caused and how it also gives a free pass to to a lot of the structures that are actually responsible for uh, for this very multifaceted ecological crisis, it, it also takes issue with with other other figures, other ideas like the Anthropocene, the idea that humans are are to blame for the ecological crisis. Uh, considering that humans have been around for a, a very very long time, and these sort of crises uh, are certainly not not universal. So basically, uh, it starts out uh, taking on the mainstream understanding of the problem, the mainstream framing of the problem as Really, a part of the problem and, and a way of continuing the problem, uh, while while those in power change masks, and then from there, the 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 meatiest chapter, the biggest chapter in the book, is uh, interviews and research, but mostly direct interviews with comrades uh, across the planet with different struggles uh, that that have been using direct action and that have been having like a localized territorial focus. Uh, using self-organization and actually making a difference, actually doing the things that that will, on the one hand, uh, solve or stop the problem to the extent that that's still possible, which it somewhat is and somewhat isn't, and on the other hand, to let to let all of us uh, adapt and survive as the planet goes through uh, some very painful and cataclysmic changes. And then the the last two chapters in the book. Uh, look at like kind of extrapolating from these examples of, of real life struggles, what sort of changes need to happen, uh, locally and globally in order to, to really make a difference, in order to really enable, uh, as, as many of us as possible, humans and non-humans, uh, to survive in, in the most dignified way possible. And I, I wrote this book because it's, it's an issue that's, um, always been really, really important to me, but it's also one that, uh, I think more often than not is, is poorly addressed in, in ways that just kind of confuse things more or, or, or at the very least don't help out much. And so I think I really had to wait until, um, until I was able to write this book because a, a great many people came together and, and helped out with this. It was, um, uh, in a lot of ways, a collaborative effort from Brazil to Indonesia to France uh, comrades all over the world helped out with this book and like without that global perspective um it it's just uh i mean it's it's such like a i mean to call it a huge problem is is an understatement and and so i wanted to to actually be able to offer something uh with this book 
What are your thoughts on works like Desert? And also, I've plugged this before on the show. You know, you have a piece called Welcome to the Future about climate change that came out maybe 10 years ago at this point. Uh, that was a shorter text. But what do you think of kind of the works that have already come out from anarchists, you know, Desert probably being one of the key texts that addresses this topic already. Well, I'll start with my own. Um, I guess, yeah, like Welcome to the Future was like a three three short articles, like in a series, uh, more more fuel for the fire, more root for the fire, anarchist solution to global warming. I think it would be generous to say that the, like those I wrote them, uh, maybe, I don't know, eight years ago or something, like se- several years ago, more than eight years ago. Those were very underdeveloped. I, I, but yeah, when I look back on them, I don't, I don't see them uh, offering very much that's useful. I mean, like the, like the basic central lines of those like three short articles I wrote, I think are like, like more or less valid, like criticizing uh, green energy and and green capitalism, uh, and talking about how like anarchist methodologies with like local self organization that you know confederate globally that that actually. Uh, you know, can bring a lot to the table. That's actually like a very particularly effective way to, to deal with um, uh, something like a, a global ecological crisis. Uh, but for example, I was also using a lot of the same figures that I'm now critical of, like this idea, like the putting the focus on global warming, for example. Uh, yeah, I uh, appreciate you plugging those those articles in the past, but I definitely now uh, encourage people to um, like if, if they, you know, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm, yeah, I don't, don't like those texts so much anymore. And, and they're definitely very underdeveloped. Desert. Uh, Desert is, is a very important, uh, book. I think I might spend more time on criticisms than what I like about it, but that shouldn't be a reflection of, of me disliking the text just because the criticisms I think will take a little bit longer to like explain well. But it was really important for someone to write a text like that. Uh, encouraging anarchists to think about the future in that way. I think that was really helpful. I think that was really important. And, and that's, um, I think, one of the strongest parts of that text. I think in some of the particulars, uh, they're, they're off the mark. So like so, uh, some criticisms I would give would be that um, I think a framework that focuses on collapse is usually going to be counterproductive. Uh, civilizations will eventually collapse, but capitalism uh, is is especially resilient at avoiding collapse, at turning like a sort of pre-collapse into uh, the manure for, for its future expansion and growth in the way that capital- capitalism is cyclical. And, and on a strategic level, most revolutionary strategy, or at, as far as we know to this point, all revolutionary strategies that have been based on a prediction of the system collapsing under its own weight have been wrong, have not been borne out, uh, have been bad strategies and have contributed to Ironically, the collapse of revolutionary movements. So that's, I think, just bad strategy. It's it's good to be able to imagine collapse, but not to put so much emphasis on it that we're like sure that you know there's no other way for this to turn out. And so in in that vein, I think it could have used from a little bit more geopolitical analysis of how capitalism and states function globally and how they at this point they prop each other up globally. And so the, like the sort of prediction in desert of sort of like a patchwork a patchwork world in which, you know, you have like enclaves of the state and then, you know, sort of like these sort of like wilderness desert areas. To me, that that works more for the latest zombie movie than it does for like an actual analysis of of the way that systems are globally integrated and globally reinforcing at, at this point. So uh, like those those are not like, you know, those aren't the most important lines of that text. Like, I think that's a very important text. And I'm, and I'm grateful for it. But I do have those. um those disagreements with it. So the past couple of months have been marked by increased warming. You know, as we're talking, like one of the big environmental stories is the melting in the Arctic, uh, you know, at a rate that surprised even many scientists. There's been another report that's uh, dropped from the IPCC, uh, which was put out right as Biden ironically delivered his state of the union speech. What do you make of where we're at right now? And what does this say about the trajectory we're on? We're, I mean, we're in a bad place. Uh, a lot of people are suffering. A lot of people are dying. A lot of uh, species are going extinct. A lot of habitats are getting destroyed. We also have pretty much all the power, all the potential for, for power in a subversive way that we had yesterday, that we had a few years ago. And, and either way, like we still, we still need to do everything that we can. Like the, 
you know, there's no too late point. A hundred years ago, it was too late for, for a lot of people. 500 years ago, it was too late for a lot of people. 500 years for now, like there's still going to be X amount of humans and other living things left that need to, to, to fight to, to help the planet heal from, from centuries of capitalism in the state. One thing that it says about the trajectory is that scientific institutions are conservative. Uh, before I go into this more, um, I, I want to say that what, you know, what might be a recurring theme throughout this interview is complexity, uh, which in this case means being able to, to hold seemingly contradictory things in balance. Uh, so the scientific method is, is very valuable and it's, you know, confirmed things that other people were already saying about how it's bad to, uh, to treat the planet like this. And it's, and it gives a lot of precise information, but on the whole, scientific predictions have, have erred on the side of being too conservative. That this, this, uh, this thing is going to hell faster than they've been predicting. And so that means to a certain extent, we can't trust scientists and scientific institutions. That absolutely does not mean that, that we, we, you know, throw out like all scientific studies and say, or any scientific studies and say like, you know, oh, that's just someone's opinion. Um, it means we can't boil it down to, to a superficial dichotomy between either like trust science or like, you know, don't get vaccinated, head for the hills and, you know, like, I don't know, like whatever, whatever those people do. It means that in the world that we live in, in the present reality that we inhabit, the scientific method, which is, is very, very valid, although not the only way of, of, of creating valid, uh, valid knowledge, but a very, very valid way of creating knowledge cannot be divorced from the scientific institutions that are fully integrated into the state and capitalism. So what that means is we can't just wait around for the experts to solve it because not only have they failed, that's an understatement, they are responsible. You know, one thing we'll probably talk a couple times about is climate refugees under Biden. We've seen the continuation of many of Trump's draconian and racist policies attacking migrants and it's interesting because now we're seeing, you know, this opening arms of Ukrainian refugees, which, you know, is great, but it also shows this, you know, racial apartheid and disparagency. And I'm just curious, you know, as you write in the book, climate refugees are only going to be pushed continuously from their homes. And what do you think we'll see in terms of response from the state right now? We're seeing the militarization of the border, also the proliferation of militarization of borders, you know, outside of the United States. I think we'll see what what we're already seeing, but more and more intensively. Uh, yeah, like I, I currently live um, in in the Spanish state. Uh, Spain uh, still has colonial enclaves in in northern Africa, and even after you know, even after the the Spanish president started making you know solidaristic press conferences with the government of uh, you know in favor of the government in in Ukraine. Uh, Spanish, uh, you know, Spanish police and military were, were brutally repressing, um, large groups of African migrants who were, you know, using this tactic that they've developed to like, uh, organize these mass crossings where thousands of people will, will try to cross in, in one day from, from Morocco, uh, into, um, one of these like colonial Spanish enclaves, which is, you know, basically all surrounded by, by Morocco, the Moroccan government, you know, also, uh, helps with that, in that brutality. And, and so, you know, they're, they're just, they're beyond hypocrisy. They're, you know, they're completely racist. They're completely limitless in, in their ability to, to carry out violence against, uh, against anyone and anything that, that isn't convenient for them. And this was one of the very first angles that, uh, that governments first identified in the ecological crisis. They all the way back in the 1960s, when the U.S. government realized that uh, that climate change uh, was almost certainly real, they already began analyzing it as a security issue. And in NATO conferences, uh, every time they meet, they talk about they talk about refugees. They talk about you know, climate refugees and 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 uh, ecological crisis as a security problem which means responding to it uh, through acts of war. So that means uh, they're going to continue the, the same economic model that is, that is forcing people to flee from their homes. And then they're going to enact continuing and, and intensifying forms of, of violence against those people. In the U S last year, we saw this crisis develop uh, when photos came out of border patrol agents, literally whipping uh 
Haitian uh, migrants at the border. And it felt like that was a time sort of like when the photos came out of young people being put into cages in ICE detention facilities where there might have been an opportunity to mobilize. It seemed like that didn't happen. I know in, um, you know, so-called Europe, there's, there's been decades of anti-border camps and stuff like that and people acting in solidarity with migrants. What advice do you think those movements could give people in the U.S.? as this is just going to continue and we're going to continue to see this, you know, racial disparagency. Cause I feel like this is something that is just not addressed by the left in general. The U S uh, the U S government has the advantage of, of having very draconian punishments in place, but I don't think that, I mean, that's not something that just fell from the sky. And I think strategically radical movements in the U S have, have not done enough to, to try to blunt those teeth to, to discourage the government from using its full repressive apparatus. And, and that's actually, that's actually a place where you would have potential for, uh, much broader coalitions, you know, beyond just like radical anarchists. And you have the potential for a, a, a huge diversity of tactics, like including even like a, an effective place for things like civil disobedience. Um, and, and, you know, all like the whole gamut, like sabotage, uh, confrontation protests and riots, civil disobedience, like that could actually all exist in solidarity because over here, I mean, you have groups that um, can directly specifically help migrants cross the border and get in. Uh, you have a number of boats that are, that are plying the Mediterranean. Uh, in fact, the Mediterranean is, is an even deadlier border than, than the Sonoran desert uh, in terms of the number of, of migrants killed. Um, and, and, you know, who like, uh, like boats, uh, you know, like organized by these groups that can specifically, uh, rescue people who are, who are in, you know, rafts that are, they're sinking and, and can bring them to port. Uh, you, you have, you know, you have people who, who, um, you know, can like, who, like comrades who help smuggle folks across land borders. Um, whereas like in the U.S., like a lot of the, a lot of the, the campaigns, like no more deaths and stuff, have been severely limited by, you know, like leaving water, but being very, very careful not to do things that, uh, that can lead to prison sentences, which is practically anything, you know, past, past leaving water. And there have been a few cases of, of people disobeying those laws and trying to take it to court. Uh, but, um, you know, it would be a lot more effective if, if those were, if those were larger campaigns, of course. And so, so I think especially in the U S context, um, trying to take those weapons out of the hands of the state as much as possible. Like the, like their ability to threaten people with years in prison for, um, you know, for, for trying to cross the border to save their lives for helping someone else trying to cross the border to save their lives. Do the elites have a plan? Um, or is, you know, is there a vague consensus about what should be done? Cause from the outside looking in, it just seems like right now they're just sort of like taking, it's seriously, this is something they will even like acknowledge is happening. But beyond that, it's just kind of like shrugging shoulders. I mean, it's the contradiction that they have simultaneously been taking it seriously for a very long time since like the 1960s and also not taking it seriously at all. So they recognized early on that this was a security issue, that this was a threat. Uh, and they've been responding to it that way, uh, very effectively with border measures, with military measures, with technological measures. And then on the other hand, you know, we're talking about institutions and people who run those institutions that are so powerful, they have a, um, a very distorted sense of their own invulnerability. Uh, I would say that there is an emerging consensus that at this point is uh, fairly predominant uh, among um, uh, economic planners and corporate leaders in most sectors, uh, among military planners. Uh, among academics and, and elite scientific institutions that it has on board pretty much everyone except some, some like mid-level capitalist recalcitrants, like mostly clustered in like, you know, media and, and like some, some extractive industries and then like a, a big chunk of politicians, uh, for, for various, um, yeah, reasons just, uh, relating to how, how reactionary democracy can get sometimes. Uh, but overall, I would say that there is very much an, an emerging consensus uh, within elite institutions that this is a very real problem 
uh, and that a lot needs to be done. And there's even growing consensus around something like a Green New Deal, even though it would very likely not use that name since it's like a politically charged name. And, you know, the large parts of the right wing that are taking this problem seriously, you know, wouldn't want to, um, you know, concede that that kind of victory to the to the center left. But I, even in even in kind Countries that are, uh, you know, whose economies depend on fossil fuels, like like Saudi Arabia, they they are very frantically trying to convert as much of their profit as possible into into other industries or or other sectors that that have growth opportunities. So like they're they're recognizing that you know the the party's over. The problem is all of them think that you know they have another few years or another few decades to to pump you know as much carbon into the atmosphere but to make the right kinds of profit off of it or rather to to reinvest those profits in in the right areas uh like all of them are doing that uh and that's because of how capitalism works structurally getting all of these entities to focus on their own short-term economic interests even as they do cultivate an awareness of of what's coming down the road so i think they're aware of it i think they are increasingly um supporting plans that are that are not good for the planet they're not good for uh for people um they're not good for the ecosystem but they at least give capitalism a a shot at at surviving at projecting itself into the rest of this century and so what does that look like that looks like uh industrial massive scale uh renewable energy green energy which is extremely environmentally destructive but you know hey it's green uh that means um a lot more social spending uh to allow for big big transitions in like employment sectors in what employment looks like and you know what what are the sectors that are actually you know creating jobs uh, or offering jobs um Throughout this change, it looks like a lot more surveillance technology, a lot more militarization of borders, militarization of uh, daily life, uh, preferably in like a soft, friendly way that's, you know, more tech heavy, you know, and rather than like, you know, the, the 20th century image of, you know, a boot, a boot on your face. Um, so it, it, it looks like a lot of the things that, you know, progressives are already behind, but that actually prioritize the needs of capitalism and the state over the, the needs of the environment, over the needs of, of living beings, uh, you know, humans and others. I know that there's famously, like, reports from, like, Chevron and other companies about, like, hey, this is what we're doing to the environment. Um, but unpack that a little bit more. I mean, like, you know, they've known this long. Uh, what's kind of the history of that, and how have they responded to their own knowledge of the situation? Already in the 19th century, <clears throat> the possibility of climate change on a global scale is being discussed. And in fact, in the centuries before that, uh, climate change, like deliberately engineering climate change was something that uh, state planners from Columbus to, I'm, I think, George Washington, maybe Thomas Jefferson, were already proposing. Like they had already witnessed how mass deforestation actually affects affects the climate. They were looking on a more localized level. Uh, but they were they were putting it in into that optic of, of social control, social engineering and, and also really eco social engineering. Um, so that awareness, which is already couched completely in statist terms, in terms of, of control and exploitation in the 19th century, is adapted or expanded by some scientists to propose uh, the very real theoretical possibility of of climate change, of global warming. In the early 20th century, uh, the first actual studies uh, start to come out. Uh, actually, going back to the 19th century, even uh, Kropotkin talked about it, interestingly enough. <laughs> but, um, yeah, early 20th century, some of the first uh, studies start to come out. Uh, around the 50s and 60s, there, there are an increasing number of studies coming out, and the majority of them are already uh, pointing towards global warming, to- pointing towards the greenhouse uh, effect as a real and present danger. And uh, a presidential commission of the United States studies this possibility. Also, some of the major oil industries study this possibility, and they come to the same conclusions. They come to the conclusion that this is um, this is a likely, uh, in fact, probable scenario. What do they do? Coincidentally, immediately after that, the U.S. media, and to a lesser extent, media in other parts of the world, start uh, bombarding the public 
with news about the possibility of global cooling that uh, that in fact there might be a danger that you know from you know either natural effects or from certain industrial pollutants uh, the the world temperature might start to go down and, and we might plunge into a new ice age. So from the beginning they they were uh, they understood the danger they went into damage control um, and uh, and and you know started misinforming the public while making plans for for you know dealing with crisis increasing their own power etc. We can already talk about a, a scientific consensus, like not just a majority of studies, but like an actual developed consensus uh, in the 70s in terms of people who are studying this. Uh, you know, more than 95 percent of them agree uh, that that uh, the greenhouse effect is real and it is happening and it's a big danger. And roughly what kind of temperature, you know, uh, change we're looking at and what the effects of, uh, of that on the planet um, that would be. So, like, you know. Rough but accurate estimates, like less detailed than now, but like, but you know, overall accurate. That's that that already exists in in the seventies, late seventies, uh, definitely early eighties, and like global institutions of scientists don't actually really make that consensus official. They don't announce what the specialists in their field already believed um, for like really like another two decades, um, and then you don't really have governments. Uh, making declarations about it um, for like another decade and you don't have governments promising to do things about it and not actually really doing any of those things until like right now. So, so that's, that's kind of like the rough timeline. And like, so we can talk about like decades, half a century or more being deliberately wasted by, uh, by those in power. But they're going to be competing blocks within the coming terrain in terms of like different governments and elite institutions and corporations like pushing certain things and then like others wanting to go and like, you know, quote a green direction. Are we going to kind of see a competition with that or are, is that already playing out geopolitically? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's playing out. There is, there's something of a competition. Most democratic governments are fairly paralyzed around this. <laughs> Just because like the, the most, uh, the most reactionary, um, sector of, of capitalists, uh, have, I think, disproportional weight in, in the media and in the political system, in the traditional political system. And, and so most democratic governments have been, uh, pretty paralyzed, uh, making like big structural changes. Uh, some of them, like the, you know, the more progressive ones have been going ahead pretty quickly on um i mean quickly for governments on uh industrial scale renewable energy but that's that's you know very much uh too little too late especially if you know especially if the u.s remains as um um as as I don't know, paralyzed as it has uh, i i thought that that might um possibly give an advantage to to governments that are more technocratically run like uh like china that might have a little bit more executive independence to be able to just go ahead and, and institute a more aggressive, bold plan. Uh, but recently, uh, she announced that, you know, with so with the global economy uh, cooling down, um, she announced that economic growth had to take precedence over uh, over climate targets and emissions reductions targets. And, and so that, I think, kind of puts to rest that uh, that possible scenario and it makes it clear that, you know, in the end, there's a lot more similarity between those different models of government. And I mean, in the end, China is ultimately a capitalist state. And so in the end, it does have to uh, respond to the same uh, bottom line that corporations that hold a lot of sway uh, over the U.S. government do. Uh, their, you know, their entire technocratic plan is based on certain projections for economic growth. And that economic growth still comes overwhelmingly from fossil fuels. So that's, uh, you know, there's there's a debate, but it feels a bit more like uh, a bit more like a puppet show. Well, in the book, you return to this concept of social war um, as kind of like an, an extension of you know the classic anarchist idea of class war. Why is that important? I think social war is a very important uh, theoretical framework for understanding the world that we live in, because even though the capitalist bottom line is very important, it's it's not the most important thing. Uh, the world doesn't really make sense. All of the things that happen in the world don't really make sense if we try to reduce it all to, to economics. 
because capitalism has no space in which to move without states uh, aggressively occupying uh, and engineering that space. And states uh, use a framework that primarily, I think, should be described as social war, which is a war of the state against society always, at all times, at every moment. The state is constantly occupying territory and constantly trying to re-engineer territory so that it is territory that can be more easily governed. Uh, and, you know, that goes, you know, that extends from everything to, to urban architecture uh, being designed to be more easily policed to, uh, you know, the, the things that were taught, uh, the, the culture that is that's officially encouraged. Um, it's it's something that's that's very pervasive. Uh, and, you know, in the end, uh, states can continue with with like a like a suspended wartime economy, like temporarily suspending you know, uh, aspects of capitalism or in the case of capitalist collapse, uh, states can continue, uh, and then, you know, try to, to, you know, re-implant, you know, sort of normal, you know, happy, everything's fine capitalist economy uh, at some point in the future. But the reverse is not true. Capitalism cannot continue when there's no, uh, when there's no state to, to protect it. So reducing things just to economic growth is not, um, I think is not an adequate uh, it's not an adequate metric. It's not, it's not an adequate theoretical lens. So we really do need to understand how the government is constantly engaged in social war and how a huge part of that social war actually requires a war on nature. Not nature is something separate from humanity. And in fact, the very dichotomy of humans versus nature is, is a tool. It's a, it's a weapon in that social war. Uh, states have always waged war on the living earth because the living earth, uh, gives us survival without having to, to um, you know, without having to bow down to authority, without having to to respect ownership, uh, without having to work for others. Uh, I mean, you know, the, like the world gives us an opportunity for survival uh, in a place of solidarity, mutual aid and self-organization. And the state very much needs to destroy uh, that that world in order to create the prison world that uh, that we inhabit. So all states have been ecocidal uh, as far back as you want to go, however many thousands of years you want to go back. If there's something that we can call state, it was ecocidal because its very existence required it to wage a constant war against uh, the living planet. Yeah, yeah. Aha. Uh-huh. Real, real life. Real life. Real music. Real music. For, For real, real people. people. For real people. Listen up. I wake up, look out the window, see three feet of snow for real. Meters go, your laws just beat us so Get the pen and the pattern, start writing the verse. Like I know the procedure, like this time ain't the first. But it could be the last, gotta make the most of it. Yo, my people forgive me, I know I'm so stubborn. Gotta quit fucking around, death could come so sudden. Make it hate me sometimes, but all I want is more loving. I know what you're thinking, but this ain't another last song. Call it my first song, live it, cater to my first bones, baby, mother. There ain't no other one life to live, one love to give. I'm gon' give it don't. Uh, to my people's revolutionary spirit, turn it up. Real life music, lose it when you hear it, burn it up. Live it on and sing along with the lyrics. One life, one love to give. I'm gon' give it don't. Uh, to my people's revolutionary spirit, turn it up. Giving I hope, cause I don't know who's right Guess it isn't the Pope, guess it isn't the point either What I mean is, Jesus Do we really need our leaders, or do they need us? Where do they lead us? Look at the riches of the world and they won't even feed us I say enough is enough and man, nothing and nothing is nothing They huffing and puffing, they bluffing, they pushing the button I'm rushing, they lunching, the cousin, they cousins and uncles And brothers and mothers and lovers and others and fuck it Wasting my breath on the mini quitty workers When I need to step from this inner city circus Fitting perfect, and they playing when it's weed that hurt us Pressing down when the only way that's really gonna work is uh, For my people's revolutionary spirit Turn it up, real life music, lose it when you hear it Burn it up, dive it on and sing along with the lyric One life, one love to give, I'm gon' give it on uh, To my people's revolutionary spirit Turn it up Whipping stuffed enough shit to make a sausage feel envy 
failures, we must quit, we must stop, we must go to get crops, we must sow good seed, water it, shine a light, and to grow, but all of pesticides is genocide, truth, some rights, I write through, my boots, step inside, render my heart, and up my garment, I'm picking that part, pick me apart with all your comments, I'm begging the pardons, kicking back at the apartment, watching, plotting, starting, charging, and when the venomous sings, all the gentlemen kings, the pendulum swings, back and forth, they pack the Sword, mightier than my pen, the hackers all of peace Again, do we really need our leaders? Or do they need us? Where do they lead us? I tell you down, down, down. What time up? For my people's revolutionary spirit Turn it up Real life music, lose it when you hear it Burn it up Dive it on and sing along with the lyrics One life, one love to give I'm gon' give it, don't uh. To my people's revolutionary spirit Turn it up With the war in Ukraine, we're already starting to hear about the impacts of food shortages. And this is something you bring up in the book. How will these shortages uh, be Im- impacted as climate change continues forward? And what do you think these things will play out like? These shortages are real, but also at the same time, uh, we need to be careful of, of scarcity discourses because there is more than enough food on this planet for everyone to have a healthy life. Uh, scarcity is socially engineered. And that's definitely no different with the situation in Ukraine. Um, maybe I'll just, I'll just float this question out there to listeners, anyone who wants to do a deeper dive and more research. But I'm pretty sure that, uh, so, okay, right now, I don't know what, what is being most felt, uh, over in the States, but in Europe, there are huge, um, sunflower oil shortages with sunflower oil being like one of the most important processed oils here. So it's in, it's in, you know, just about everything. <laughs> um, uh, as, as far as I can tell, uh, sunflowers, which are, you know, overwhelmingly, uh, produced in Ukraine are, they're harvested in like August, September, depending on the weather. And they're, um, they're planted in, uh, late March at the earliest, April. So last year's sunflower harvest happened. Uh, and at worst, if this war continues, which it probably will, then, then this year's planting of sunflowers will be, will be negatively impacted, uh, which will be an issue for next winter's, uh, uh sunflower oil. So I'm kind of curious about, uh, how all of a sudden there's a, a shortage of the sunflower oil from the sunflowers that were harvested and processed, uh, last summer and fall. Uh, my feeling is that it's, it's probably, uh, you know, one of the typical shortages that, um, that speculators, that capitalists manufacture in times of war. War is a great excuse to, to speculate and to make bank for, for capitalists. Capitalists love war. Um, that's the kind of people they are. Uh, so that's, that's my guess. I wouldn't, I want to say again, like I haven't done like the solid research to make sure like that that's, Actually, what happened, like, who knows, maybe there's a big tank that has all of Europe's sunflower oil and it's like sitting right side of right outside of Kharkiv and it got blown up. Uh, I don't know. Uh, probably not. But yeah, if anyone else wants to do more research on that one. But anyways, we know that, that capitalists take advantage of war to speculate. So uh, scarcity is real. Uh, the disasters of war, of drought, of wildfires, all of those all those disasters are real and they do affect uh, our ability to grow food. but at, at the moment in history that we currently inhabit, all scarcities are socially engineered by capitalists and by the state. And we also know from, you know, our like relatively like, brief experiences with revolution and self-organization in the 20th century, uh, that when, you know, when we have anarchy, when we have revolutionary movements that, that exist on the principle of solidarity, uh, 
scarcity in in one region because of some kind of disaster isn't a problem because we we take care of us we take care of each other and we will we will take care of that that will not be a problem we'll take food from the places that have it to the places that don't and we'll get through this uh what's preventing us from doing that are our borders and capitalism so throughout the world we're continuing to see you know really inspiring ecological and frontline indigenous struggles and at the same time we're continuing to see these kind of like large scale performative marching circles at times climate strikes and rallies i believe there's just a wave of them that happened last week sort of a, a blip in the news cycle of course with you know rich people slapping each other at award ceremonies how do you think we should continue to intervene and interact at all with kind of these climate strikes? I think this is going to be one of those places where, where we definitely need to embrace complexity, uh, especially when we're talking about revolutionary strategies. Like if you, if you can't, if you can't like accept that sometimes, you know, reality contains contradictory elements, like you, like we, we need that in order to be able to discuss useful strategies. Otherwise we just get more, binary moralistic crusades which have done so much damage to uh to our movements so so i'm going to say two things and and i hope that people can hear both of them even though they, they seem to be at odds um those those new um those new movements uh that that popped up very recently uh like extinction rebellion fridays for the future those movements contain uh, a lot of people who who are very sincere and with whom we could potentially uh, work in solidarity and and people who definitely have the potential to be doing good things and and some of whom already are doing good important things that's one thing uh, the other thing is um, that some of those movements especially extinction rebellion can be uh, accurately Analyzed as counterinsurgency campaigns, as uh, as campaigns that uh, that sprouted up in order to um, destroy, weaken, or um, re reconduct, uh, like divert, uh, reposition um, real, meaningful, effective movements. Right. So. Um, Indigenous peoples have been struggling against the the causes of the ecological crisis for centuries. Um, anarchists uh, who who are not indigenous anarchists, uh, anarchists, um, uh, you know, for example, like European anarchists, um, you know, more than a hundred years ago started uh, started paying uh, increasing increasing attention to to the ecological crisis. Um, uh, peasant movements. Uh, around the world, uh, you know, on, on all continents, uh, you know, where, where, you know, there are still populations that we can speak of as peasants have, have also been fighting for the commons and, and fighting for what are often very effective ways at, um, at protecting the earth with ourselves as, as, as a part of the earth. So we're talking about centuries of accumulated experience and uh and struggle and collective wisdom and sometimes even important victories and a group like extinction rebellion pops up and and even even though they don't have like any like you know direct like you know weren't directly created by the state like the way that they they very much come out of of other elite institutions like like the academy in this in this case um they very much reflect uh state thinking and they very deliberately um want to start from a clean slate uh, because those other movements are, are too threatening. Uh, they go to the root of the problem and they also threaten the institutions of power that uh, the founders of some of those movements depend on for their, for their privilege and power. Um, so, so both of those things are true. Uh, Extinction Rebellion is, uh, is in effect, it functions as a counterinsurgency operation to, to state, save the state's ass and to save capitalism, uh, from itself. Uh, but also in, in many places, those movements are, are going to be worth engaging with. They're going to be necessary to engage with. And they include, uh, many people who could be comrades. Um, so a lot of it comes down to paying attention, like, you know, how out of control are they? Uh, like, you know, has like a local group 
you know, bucked the control of the national organization or whatever, things like that. And, and we found like here in, in Catalonia, we, we found that it was very effective to, um, to participate in movements that seemed, uh, that from the outset kind of seemed kind of terrible. It seemed just like reformist and they weren't looking at what the actual problem was and, and all the rest. Uh, so we had experience with that, um, with uh, the 15M movement, the movement that was one of the movements that was a precursor of, of Occupy Wall Street in the States. Uh, and, and I'll admit that, like, you know, the first couple of days, I, I was completely wrong about that. I was like, oh, no, that's like, you know, reformist movement. Let's not go there. Fortunately, other anarchists did go there and they found that um, they were having very, very good conversations. And that I think is that's that's something to look out for. Like, can you actually talk uh, about real things with people? Um, the folks who are just worried about like, you know, making a protest for the photo op, you're not going to have an interesting conversation with them because you're going to see that, you know, all they care about is how this plays in the media, which means they don't even understand what planet they're living on. Like they have no idea what is actually happening. They don't, they don't grasp the problem. And in fact, they're, they're supporting the institutions that are at the root of the problem. Uh, but if you can have good conversations about what the actual problem is, then that's, that's, that means that there's room to actually do worthwhile things. And so early on, anarchists going to some of these movements that were intended to be astroturf movements. They were intended to be movements that gave the system another chance to fix itself, uh, no matter how many people it had to, to hurt to do it. Um, uh, and it actually took parts of those movements out of control. So in cities where a lot of people with a radical analysis intervened, like Barcelona, they actually became radical movements. And in other cities where, where anarchists and other radicals didn't do that work, those movements remained, um, you know, astroturf reformist movements that didn't really do any good for anyone. Uh, on, there's, you know, a more extreme example from uh, uh, Ukraine with uh, the Maidan movement um, in cities where where anarchi- real anarchists, not, you know, not national anarchists who are, who are fascists and not, not anarchists, but real anarchists, where real anarchists either could not stand up to the fascists or, or chose not to, the fascists took over. I mean, they didn't completely take over the movement. They were never a majority, but they certainly effectively used those movements uh, to further their own ends uh, in, in, in Ukraine. And in the cities in Ukraine where anarchists chose to and were able to kick out the fascists, then the movement in their city went in a completely different direction. Uh, the far right did not get empowered. And in fact, uh, anarchist politics and anarchist organizing uh, gained a lot more, uh, a lot more tools, a lot more perspective, and a lot more possibilities. So um, I think we need to, to, to you know, approach um, groups like Extinction Rebellion in, in a similar way. Like talk to the base, make relationships with the base, see if we can do things that are actually worthwhile and are not just photo ops to, uh, you know, increase their followers on Twitter or, or whatever, whatever metric they're using. For success. Now you write in one chapter, chapter three, about victories that add up. So tell us, tell us some good stuff. Tell us some good news. What, what are some of these victories? Uh, so, so chapter three is the that's the big that's the big fat chapter in the book, the biggest one, and that's the one that I mentioned is is based all in either direct interviews or or in cases where that was impossible with uh, like summaries of of research accounts of social struggles around the world, uh, social struggles that that are using methods that I think make sense for this kind of problem uh, that are using more anarchistic methods, even though many of those struggles don't identify as anarchists. That's, that's fine. Um, and, and actually accomplishing things, actually stopping the concrete projects of capitalism, uh, which are destroying this planet. And interestingly enough, you know, they're, they're just as likely to be stopping a coal mine as they are to be stopping a, a new, um, wind park of like an you know, industrial scale uh, wind energy generation. Um, again, you know, making the driving home the point that uh, that green energy is also terrible for the planet and terrible for you know those of us who live on this planet. Uh, green energy at a, at a massive industrial scale. It is. Um, so uh, some examples of that. <clears throat> Let's see. I I did um, some really inter- interesting interviews. Uh, with with comrades in Brazil, in Venezuela, in Indonesia, in in France, in North America, um, to talk about a couple of those. Uh, so there's um, uh, there's uh, a project um, in um, in in Brazil, uh, Teia dos Povos, 
uh, another one in in Indonesia um, on on the island of Borneo. Um, I can start with that one, um, where a, um, a a Dayak anarchist, Dayak being uh, one of the one of the indigenous peoples of of Borneo. Uh, a Dayak anarchist uh, put me in touch with uh, some of the communities that he organizes with, some of the Dayak communities that are that are you know inland in the in the highlands of Borneo, and this is a territory that is being devastated by uh, palm oil production. And uh, you know palm oil is really interesting because you know it's it's also used it's used in a lot of uh, industrial products, uh, it's it's used in a lot of you know green ecological products. Um, and and it's it's extremely destructive. Like these these uh, these plantations are an act of ongoing uh, colonialism against local indigenous peoples. Uh, they cause massive deforestation, uh, impoverishment, uh, and all the rest. And they're controlled by by mafias that are that are you know completely the same. They're indistinguishable from uh, from the local government. And uh, some of these communities have uh, been able to start organizing against uh, against you know the political pressure and the economic pressure to, to support themselves so that they don't have to give in to you know signing contracts to you know giving over their land to, to palm oil plantations. They're able to they're more able to resist uh, some of the the paramilitary pressure, which which is also used to to advance these palm oil plantations. Uh, they can they can set up uh, blockades, uh, reoccupy their territory, defend their territory, and they can also get uh, get help, get solidarity from the outside, from people who have access to to resources that uh, that are harder to uh, to acquire in their territory. And so it's an ongoing fight. Uh, you know, it's not certainly isn't over. It's it's a fight where they need um, they need a lot of support. Uh, the you know, repression definitely uh, affected. The interview process while, while it was happening, um, you know, affected, uh, directly affected people who were helping out with the book. Um, and in a way that I, I can't, I can't go into the specifics yet, but, you know, uh, eventually there will definitely be calls for support. Um, but they have, they have stopped a number of palm oil plantations and, you know, they can stop more with, with more support. So in Brazil, I actually talked to comrades from two different groups. The first was Teia dos Povos. Which is a network of, of base nuclei of different groups, different communities in Bahia and, and other states that focus on food sovereignty and other forms of autonomy. Uh, they're, they're related to, uh, the whole experience that's more well known of, of like the landless workers movement. Uh, but they especially focus on creating a black indigenous and popular alliance. Uh, some of their, some of their communities are, are land occupations that are more recent. Some of them are, are indigenous communities or quilombos that, that go back, uh, with like hundreds of years of resistance against colonialism, against capitalism. And that's, that's one very, very powerful network that exists, uh, in, in, in large parts of Brazil and is, is, uh, driving home a really important strategy of bringing different people together who have been hurt by capitalism and and through practices of food sovereignty through practices of of um indigenous resistance around food culture and around a a, a relationship with other species with the environment that that allows for uh for like a healthy survival and also for um for for healing uh healing the land after centuries of colonialism they're really striking at uh at mm, a lot of the roots of uh of the state of capitalism uh, of white supremacy another experience is cultiva resistencia uh which is a rural anarchist group uh in the atlantic forest region that is in in an alliance in or in a solidaristic relationship with several guarani communities Whose lands have been devastated by by mining uh, going back a long time, and so those communities, uh, with with solidarity and support from this uh, anarchist group, are in a process of recovering their lands and healing the land uh, after after all these years of, of uh, mining damage, um, but also feeding themselves while they uh, while they heal the land, like feeding themselves from the land. So really breaking the whole dichotomy between like, you know, human use and, and, you know, natural use or, or, you know, nature preserves and whatnot. And, and actually showing that, you know, all of our survival works a lot better. It makes a lot more sense uh, when 
we link our survival with the survival of the earth and and develop practices that um, you know can restore forests, can restore the soil, and that can also uh, use localized food cultures for for communities to feed themselves. And then, like a, a final example that, that I can mention, I, uh, I talk a little bit about um, the the zads, the zones to defend uh, that um, you know started out with uh, one one campaign and land occupation against an airport uh, in northern France, and then spread um, uh, across France and, and to a few other places. And and in that that one, that's a very interesting story because like the original zad, it defeated the airport, but there's also big questions about how do we define victory. Like, is it victory just when we defeat one mega project or is it actually something of a defeat if then what we create gets reintegrated back into the system? And so those are really important strategic debates that we need to be happening. And I try to, to hopefully add a little bit and at the very least, um, you know, bring out those, those, those debates, uh, so that they can, they can happen, you know, with access to, to more of our collective experience uh, around the world. Also, um, all of the all of the author royalties, all of the money that would go uh, to to the author to me for this book, uh, all of it is going to uh, anarchist supported projects in Brazil and and in Indonesia. So, um, because I mentioned the book, you know, was was born out of these international networks of, of solidarity, uh, the idea is for the book also to be a tool of solidarity and and creating support for um, for folks in in struggles in some places where resources are scarce. You're listening to It's Going Down, part of the Channel Zero Anarchist Podcast Network. Follow us online at itsgoingdown.org and on Twitter at IGD underscore news. If you like and appreciate this podcast, go to itsgoingdown.org slash shop and give us a one-time donation. Sign up to donate monthly or donate through Bitcoin. Again, that's itsgoingdown.org slash shop to support. And now, back to the show. Well, I'm curious, you know, in recent years, we've seen in the U.S. there's been libertarian socialists and municipalist groups uh, self-described that are buying land and working on food sovereignty projects. Probably the most well-known one would be a long-running organization like Cooperation Jackson. How do you think that projects like this can fit into a larger strategy? Uh, Cooperation Jackson is is a very, very important uh, project that, that draws on like a, a very – deep and, and vast pool of, of experience in revolutionary movements. Uh, it's, it's one that, you know, doesn't, uh, it doesn't come from or, or identify with, uh, with the anarchist tradition and that's fine. And I think we need to be looking for ways to build more solidarity with, um, uh, with projects like that. Uh, and, you know, so, like we can have solidarity while also having strategic differences, like under, under the right conditions. Uh, it's, it's perfectly possible. Uh, for the book, uh, I had some interesting conversations with, um, with two, two comrades from, from Venezuela, two Chavistas, uh, from Venezuela who come from a, a very different, um, revolutionary tradition, uh, from my own. And, and in some, in some aspects, um, you know, we also have like very, very strong, important, uh, strategic differences. And those differences shouldn't be swept under the rug. They shouldn't be ignored. Uh, but if, you know, if there's, basic respect uh and and like the possibility for solidarity like you know for you know we're not talking like you know is setting up gulags or anything uh then and, and you know there's a possibility also for for self critique that each side is is open to criticism and is like you know making its own criticisms of 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 its own experience then i think there's really fruitful possibilities uh for solidarity even with uh with groups that you know we might have major disagreements with uh, it's also worth pointing out that you know among the um, 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 like among the Chavistas, there's like Chavistas from below and Chavistas from above, like the ones who, you know, went into government and the ones who didn't. And, you know, that would also definitely determine like, you know, what's, what's our possibility for, for solidarity. Um, there are a lot of experiences out there that have put some amount of hope onto entering into government. Um, uh, Cooperation Jackson, for example, uh, you know, had an experience that for them was a positive experience, although a very short lived experience. Uh, like having having an ally in in the local government in in Jackson Mississippi, um, and that's that's something that as an anarchist, like I really think that that our collective history shows us that when we go into government, you know, even if like there might be some short term advantages, they don't um, they're not worth it in the long run. They don't um, 
um, they they come with 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 very serious uh, disadvantages. But like if that's a conversation that we can have like in respectful ways, then then it absolutely makes sense to uh, to have a solidaristic, supportive relationship with groups that have like such like a, a breadth of, of of experience and capacity, like uh, like Cooperation Jackson. Um, and so yeah, like personally, I have I have a lot of uh, I have a lot of criticisms of libertarian socialism, of municipal, municipalism, of of you know communism, even if it's you know communism does they like from from below, um, and and that's okay. Like I, I I it's important for me, it's important for for us speaking now of anarchists to 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 maintain our vision, to maintain our method, to keep doing the things that we do well. Um, and but I think it's it's you know it's necessary and good and healthy and, and fruitful uh, to have solidaristic relationships with, you know, with other folks who can respect those differences and, and, you know, put them into a conversation uh, that I think we all could, uh, that we all could learn from. I'm curious what you think of prepping and there's been sort of a rise, you know, Margaret Killjoy is doing some amazing things, pushing like an anti-fascist anarchist uh, take on prepping. What do you think about the rise of of that, just in general, but also anarchists kind of taking that on? I don't know if that's something that's also happening in your neck of the woods. There are things uh, in in yeah in the Mediterranean region in the Mediterranean region that you could uh, you could analyze as prepping, but it would be a bit of a stretch um, just because of all the cultural baggage that goes with it. I think uh, I think in the vast majority of instances, prepping is is a bad thing that leads to reactionary politics, or, or is that you know completely comes out of, of reactionary politics even, uh, or that um, uh, reinforces like this this idea of collapse, like you know like you know one day collapse and you know we got to go to our well stocked cabin in the woods or whatever. Um, but I'm glad that you I'm glad you brought up Margaret Kiljoy because uh, like she's a comrade that, that I would that I would direct people towards. Like if if you want like the good revolutionary anarchist take on uh, on prepping, like, you know, look, look at what look at what Margaret's doing. Listen to what Margaret's saying, um, because I mean, like from everything I've seen, she's focusing on things that that like no matter what happens are good for us to do. Um, like uh, there's a collective focus. There's a major focus on care. Uh, it's like, it's not an individualist thing. It's about building capacities that, that are going to be helpful for us, you know, whether or not, you know, you end up with like bears roaming through the wreckage of wall street or whether, you know, uh, 10 years from now looks a lot like, you know, what things look like right now, but just worse. Uh, so, so yeah, for the most part, um, I definitely uh, stay away from prepping, but but I would definitely I would definitely rec- uh, recommend uh, Margaret Kiljoy's take on prepping. Despite all the horrors that's going on, you know, there's some amazing struggles happening. Whether it's against coastal gas link on what's what in territory, or the fight against Cop City in so-called Atlanta, I'm curious. You know, despite all the horrors going around us, uh, what's giving you hope right now? What what's keeping you going? I I don't really have hope. Um, but, but hope is a subjective thing. And so that shouldn't really matter to, to anyone else. Like it doesn't really, you know, matter that, that I don't have hope because I think it's important for, you know, people who do have hope to, to hold on to it, to share it, to, to do what they can to, to cultivate it and make it grow. Um, what keeps me going? Um, my friends, uh, my close comrades. And you don't have hope because hope is the wrong term or you just don't have hope. Um, like if I, if, if there were some like intergalactic betting agency where you could like bet, you know, again, like, you know, like, like if you, if you were, if you were a horrible person, uh, let's put it this way. If you were a horrible person and you had the means to, to, uh, coddle this horror by like, you know, possibly making money off of like, you know, things going, um, going really, really, really bad, like, you know, worse than they already are. Uh, the smart bet, I think, would be uh, to bet against us. Um, but but I'm I'm an anarchist. I don't I don't really believe in doing the the smart thing by definition. Um, so you know, um, hope. Uh, I mean, I think I, I guess like you know, people generally read me as like you know, people who do whatever read my read things that I write. I like often like read like you know like more optimistic takes in there. 
And, and I think like, you know, there is a certain optimism at the heart of anarchism, but also there's, there's this conviction that, that the long odds are worth it no matter what, you know, um, uh, like, you know, w- winning and losing are not, you know, the, like the most worthwhile terms. Um, and then, you know, the, like what we're doing are like the thing, like the important things to be doing, uh, no matter what happens, uh, down, uh, down the road. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Is there anything else that you want to talk about or any other plugs you want to give? Maybe tell people where they can get a copy of the Take book. Take care of each other. Get to know your territory. Make a distinction between, you know, people you disagree with or you dislike and like actual enemies because we have more than enough enemies and they're extremely powerful. They're way more powerful than we are. And it's, it's kind of pathetic. Uh, the worst things get like how many people dedicate so many of their attentions to treating like enemies, like, you know, people they simply uh, dislike. Um, as for the book, uh, it's, it's, uh, coming out with, uh, I mean, it's already out with, uh, with Pluto Press. Um, and yeah, I guess it's in a lot of anarchist bookstores and, and online. Um, so yeah, if, uh, yeah, anyone has any thoughts about it, uh, you know, I always, um, um, look for feedback. So, uh, yeah, just, uh, take care of each other. This has been the It's Going Down podcast. Check itsgoingdown.org for daily updates, columns, action reports, and news. Go to itsgoingdown.org slash shop to support us and follow us on all social media platforms. IGD, your daily resource for insurgent proletarian life.